villains, villains. Video games can't exist without them. For every great hero, there will always be a great villain. Well, most of the time. And each one of the list has impacted me greatly, even when I was a kid. I know what you're probably thinking at the moment. Didn't Logan, CJ, and Oscar already did a list like this? To that I say, yeah, they have done a list like this. And there will be some similar choices to these. But chances are they'll be radically different. I mean, I don't happen to be a fan of Kingdom Hearts, Shadow of the Colossus, Jackie Daxter, Ratchet, or Kid Icarus, am I? Buckle down, bad boys. It's me time. Starting off the list is none other than a single body part that is actually versatile in its own right. Master Hand from the Super Smash Bros. series. For a crossover with so many characters from different realms, there needed to be a villain created for a complicated web of factors. So, the developers just went with a simple white glove, the one I'm choosing menus, and making it a formidable opponent. And by golly, they did it! Master Hand ran the Smash Bros. tournaments, even giving them a Valiant Fighter some competition, such as creating the Fighting Polygon team and the Wireframes, even arising fighters from a trophy. And his fights in Final Destination are no exception. You know it's the series Big Bad capable of shooting lasers, missiles, and swapping and catching the opponent, even making its own hand drill, as well as other unique moves. It does at times team up with its twin, Crazy Hand, and they do provide some decent challenges, unlike the cheap bastard Taboo and Brawl, who never should make the cut. Despite the fact he seems to be more powerful than it, but that doesn't mean he should be more likable. It was quite a decent choice for a multi-crossover involving Nintendo, and I even made him as the true guardian of the Smash Realm. No joke. He might as well should be, as just a deity on restoring order from chaos. Master Hand does deserve to have more praise, much like several other villains on the list. I bet viewers are going insane when they've noticed Bowser being so low on the list. He would have taken a higher ranking, if only he wasn't so redundant. Anyway, Bowser, also known as King Koopa, is the Dragon King of the Koopas who functioned as outcasts from the Mushroom Kingdom. Bowser always seems to have that unknown motivation on capturing Princess Peach, and sometimes even marrying her. But we all know that didn't turn out so well. Although, his roots came all the way back to the events of Yoshi's Island when he was a baby. As he was jealous, he never had a chance to ride on Yoshi. Poor Koopa. If only he didn't have some bad influences by his sidekick, Kamek. Sometimes I'd feel sorry for him and the Koopalings. Always losing to Mario and living in such harsh conditions. As when I was a kid, I wanted the Koopas, excepting Bowser Jr., to be more redeemable as Bowser was surpassed by Shao Kahn 
he decided to defend Earth Realm and his player. Sadly, it never really came to pass. As I'd said, he would have taken a higher ranking if he wasn't so redundant like all of Mario's games. No matter how hard and how many times he has tried, even though some attempts were better than others. We all know he's the big bad, always wanting to defeat Mario even though I wish he would! God, it'll never stop! But he wasn't always a villain, as I wished he would have changed his motives after he functioned as an awesome powerhouse since Super Mario RPG and Bowser's Inside Story. Damn, his strength and endurance are impressive! Whoa. I was going to put Count Black on the list if only I had more experience with Super Paper Mario, which is the best Paper Mario game in my eyes. Like another certain contender, he is considered a dragon and does bring a fun twist to the whole Dragon Damsel cliche. I kind of wish he'd have his own series, much like Wario, Donkey Kong, or Yoshi, and maybe I'll consider him despite his pitiful, endless fails. No villain's list would ever be complete without mentioning Ridley from Metroid. This maniacal dragon-like space pirate has been in nearly every single Metroid game, even is more significant than the energy sun parasites, which is ironic considering Chozo has created them and Mother Brain. Ridley did make his first official appearance in a manga stating that he invaded Samus' home, the Star Colony K2L, while stealing the Afloritite there, and just allowing the pirates to do whatever they wanted, even if it was to kill everyone and everything, including Samus' parents and soon got taken in by the Chozo. Hart believes she can still remember that other end. Thanks for pointing that out, background check. Ridley has quickly soared through the ranks of the Space Pirates and became their new general, and he has been resurrected and modified many times, and even cloned once. And each fight has never ceased to disappoint, although my personal favorites would be from Super Metroid. And having to traumatize a female protagonist and always having his revenge on her? It really made a sharp left turn on the whole dragon and damsel genre, unlike the pathetic dynamic of Bowser and Peach. I was so relieved that he had been taken out for good after his demise at his own hideout, which was very catchy, by the way. And with the advent release of Metroid Dread, I sincerely doubt we'd be seeing a halt to Ridley anytime soon. Of course, the main villain from the Sonic series made it onto the scene. And yes, fanboys, I consider him as Dr. Robotnik. Whatever you say, Eggman. However you want to call him, Dr. Robotnik has been an iconic villain even sometimes surpassing Bowser, as he's not so repetitive though impetuous on his goals. From robotomizing living creatures, to building a Death Star lookalike, to dominating a major city and soon the world while creating the Eggman Empire, and even building his own intergalactic amusement park. Jeez! Bowser never had so many cool goals, albeit inconsistent. But what was consistent was how he always wanted to make Sonic pay for interfering his roles, like Ridley was to Samus, and gaining immense power from the Mastered Chaos and Hyper Emeralds, 
as he nearly succeeded in Sonic 3 and Knuckles. Unlike Bowser, he had multiple roles playing the parts, and each had some hilarious and goofy dialogue. My personal favorite being Long John Vultry. Rest in peace. At least he was succeeded by the most popular choice, Mike Pollock, and soon parodied so much by the super fan, the great Clement. Like Bowser, he is entertaining and he wasn't always evil, as when his greatest creation, Metal Sonic, went awry, or just having his ego screwed by some elder gods overpowering him. He actually switched sides and helped Sonic and his friends save the world even though he hasn't done very much. He really did have a rough upbringing, as he's the grandson of Gerald Robotnik hell-bent on revenge, and losing his sister Maria, since Shadow didn't save her. He did have his own little puzzle game in Dr. Robotnik's Me Bean Machine, which was meh. Look, I don't condole on robotomizing animals, but I kind of wish he would have succeeded in some of his goals. With an IQ of 300, I really wish he would have stuck with just one, and not be so impudent. God, I wish his amusement park or his crazy empire existed. And please bring back the amazing Ed Carrier. Forget Andros, the Aperoids, the Anglers, and General Scales. The Star Wolf team is the most deserving villain choice that represents the Star Fox franchise, paws down. After all, I do consider Wolf as one of my all-time favorite doppelgangers. Anyway, the Star Wolf team is memorable, has addictive quotes, provide decent dogfights, and always brings a smile to my face whenever they're around. Even for Logan and CJ. And they also happen to be very diverse, too, having all kinds of creatures and joining the vengeful cause. Run by Andros and Wolf O'Donnell, it has a colorful cast including the slick chameleon Leon, Andros's nephew Andrew, yeah. The treacherous swine Pigma, seriously, I'm with you on the hate, Logan. The seductive panther named, well, Panther, and even the innocent Crystal at one point. They're also skilled pilots with their signature craft, the Wolfman, a formidable rival of Star Fox's Arwings, and their mission is quite straightforward to rule over the galaxy, commit various crimes, and of course, wipe out Team Star Fox and their leader who often gets in the way of their endeavors. But they weren't always evil. As I'd stated in my doppelgangers list, Wolf does offer to give Fox help, even during the Aperoid and Angler invasions. For that, as well as the elimination of Pigma, I consider to like them even more as other villains never had a change of heart, as they don't necessarily have one. Believe it or not, their debut isn't necessarily Star Fox 64. That was my first encounter, but they have made their first debut in the cancelled beta game, later released for the SNES Mini, Star Fox 2. Yeah, go figure. And they also happen to have the original gang, except in Andrew, who was replaced by a lemur-like creature, Algae. Of course, despite their competence on making the toughest dog fights ever, each member seems to have some memorable quotes, even when you beat them. Eat your damn hearts out, Star Wars and Mass Effect! God, I love the Star Wolf team! Despite being murderous mercenaries, I always liked whenever they're around, but I only played two games. I hope Nintendo wouldn't mess up their future too much.
I'm sure you all know he'd be in here. As a Zelda villain, this is the only one that stood out the most for me. A lot of people would consider perhaps Skull Kid or Gear in him, but I never really cared for them. And as a huge fan of Ocarina of Time, he fits me like a gauntlet. There hasn't been another villain more gratifying in my eyes, and that's really saying something considering I was shunned by Majora's Mask. But ever since I was reaching puberty, this warlock lord was both intimidating and interesting. He alone opened me up to the supernatural and the dark arts of sorcery, and how corrupt power would be. Literally, as he only possesses the Triforce of Power, even though he wanted the entire sacred relic for himself. The king of the Gerudo tribe, and the only man to be born before another century, has both intrigued me and terrified me as a villain. I can honestly say his human form is so much more acceptable than his pig form, or even his disguise as the wizard Aganon, or even his Calamity Ganon. There were some others like Twilight Princess or Wind Waker, and not much else counting his human body. But all that from turning Hyrule to an apocalyptic world, setting a sinister tone at his castle, or where else he has appeared, as well as fighting his phantom and his actual self. And all that was planned well that he seems to be manipulating even Lincoln's Delta to his own doing. And he is quite satisfying and makes you prove you are the hero once you take him down. But unlike Bowser, there's a reason why he keeps coming back, since he's the descendant of the Mines. Damn! His surrogate mothers Kumi and Kotaki raised him well. Aside from Ocarina, I especially was ecstatic when I first unboxed him in Super Smash Bros. Melee, and he was a decent platformer in combat, until he was screwed over with the later installments. Even hearing his name and theme song can be enough to make you have chills down your spine, and he makes us the most talented and significant fighter, swordsman, and Warlock that can even rival and perhaps exceed Shao Kahn. I mean, seriously! All his capabilities in seeking the world into darkness and evil really does show a lot of his similarities to him. But... While on the subject of Mortal Kombat 3, there was an intimidating villain that made the cut, and believe it or not, it ain't the Outworld Emperor, as I didn't even find him presentable. And no, it's not even Shang Tsung, Shiva, Sindel, or Smoke. It actually happened to be Motaro, of all things. The Badass Centaur has made it on the list, which was pretty odd considering I used to be horrified of him when I was a kid. It was almost like scare at first sight. From his looks, his ability to deflect projectiles, to using his own tail aside from using it as an appendage or laser, to the sudden teleportation, and of course grabbing and thrashing you from across the balcony! I thought I'd never get to like this beastly mini-boss. Until... how we figured out to unlock him via cheat codes. By then it seemed kinda of broken, clobbering every combatant. Even his own duplicate, and the Emperor himself. It seemed rather epic after a while, and he slowly grew on me. His performances weren't half bad in Defenders of the Realm, or even in the abysmal Annihilation. Darren McBee did a pretty decent job, and that's really saying something. Oh, being a naive kid and reaching some broken golden standard to counter the cheating AI. I used to grow obsessed with Mortal Kombat when I was a kid, 
Even having a Jurassic Park prize plushie is him. Aside from those in Final Fantasy Mystic Quest and Hercules, it proves that Santors are awesome! And I'll consider Motaro to be my most favorite in the MK universe. <laughs> You shall can't. <laughs> oh, Final Fantasy. The everlasting JRPG juggernaut. You have a shipload of villains to choose from, such as the obvious ones like Sephiroth, Kefka, Chaos, Jekt. And no. My main villain from the complicated cluster mug is Zemus from Final Fantasy IV. Of course, there's also Gobez, but much like Ganondorf, Zemus was the true chest master. He's one of the mysterious Lunarians that were desperately looking for a new home. By the time they came across the Blue Planet, they weren't expecting a primitive lifestyle, so they decided to put themselves into hypersleep and awaken if the inhabitants were advanced as they are. However, Zemus grew impatient and agitated on their medieval ways. It was him who decided to destroy the world indirectly by simply manipulating a Lunarian boy and making him go insane resulting in his mind breaking and becoming his servant we all know. Through the powers of mind control increasing monsters dominating the planet and switching the pieces around while carrying out his plan on usurping the world's crystals? He nearly succeeded as he awakened their giant of Babel, a super weapon capable of eradicating all life. But he hit a snag as Vasoya awakened Golbez from his thrall after so many years. And they even faced him as one, which is when we see him for the first time. Boy, is he scary! Because of the death of his shell, his dark essence transformed and was unhinged by the hateful embodiment, Zeromans. His altered form nearly defeated all the heroes until they received prayers on Earth. It was finally time to take him down. His final battle was just exhilarating and frustrating. At first he became a complete void which nothing could penetrate it other than a light crystal, then his abomination left the epicness loops, from Meteor to his signature heavy hitters like Black Hole and Big Bang, even canceling summons, he does not mess around as the true Big Bad. Zeromus was indeed the beast I conquered, as it was my first ever final boss defeated in an RPG and Final Fantasy game. And through that amazing experience, I never would consider another villain from the franchise. I know Kefka literally succeeded, but Zemus and Zeromus' battles and mind-blowing capabilities I consider over any of the evildoers put together. Oh man! Now we're really digging into it! Doragon C. Mikado from The Bouncer is truly a villain that does deserve more praise into the comic consumer. Despite the fact the PS2 beat em ups like the Everlasting Beta, you should know that Doragon can make anyone shake in their boots. He started out as a tragic villain, though, as he was a kid being turned down by a hospital and saving his sister, Dominique, who was dying from terminal illness. When he was taken in by Master Mikado, he soon wished to adopt him as his own son, 
but only if he has what it takes to successfully lead the Mikado group in his stead. He has excelled in many fields of science and technology, even in martial arts as you would see on a secret computer and how he fights. And OMG! He is merciless! He was the one that killed his own surrogate father expediting his own treacherous rule, led a nightmarish kidnapping and used his android sister as a tool, launched a solar power satellite which soon became a weapon of global destruction, murdering a martial arts expert as if it were a twig, strong robots and assassin cronies are plentiful, cloning test subjects and erasing a decade of their lives, manipulating poor adults and countless victims, and increasing their starving fighting instincts making them heartless killers. And his fighting style and definite serene personality can make you shit your pants. You thought Shao Kahn was bad? You haven't seen anything yet. His attacks can leave quite a damned mark, especially when combined with the unforgiving ragdoll physics. They're swift and powerful blow, even if he should have a hand tied behind his back, or even using both arms. Even utilizing his dark key and unleashing devastating, unblockable moves. His final battle alone is where the Tower of Terror looms over and makes it a terrifying experience. As it is a multi-phase battle and can give so many players, myself included, dread, and have so much grief on beating him. I would say he can even rival the so-called legendary Shinra on those regards. He's a complete monster that can give me nightmares. He's so powerful that only two to three Saiyans can wipe him out, as you'll see in my tetralogy. Even just looking at a steer can give you the willies. Doragon? You are definitely a recipe for disaster in my book. Get out of my sight. Permanently. Before we get on to the top three, I just want to ask one simple question. Why hasn't anyone talked about Black Shadow as their favorite villain? <laughs> Making its way to third place, the Emperor of Brutality itself. And may I say he's one of the most overlooked evildoers and characters in the F-Zero series. Although I do find the entire franchise to be overlooked, but that's besides the point. Ever since I first encountered him in F-Zero GX, he shouldn't be a force to be reckoned with. I mean, sure. He happens to be a lackey compared to the death form, but still, he makes as a decent villain. For starters, he looks like a walking nightmare, and his name, Black Shadow, is like the perfect fit. With his horns, cape, and evil persona, it always made me think he came from the Shadow Realm rather than the Underworld. Besides, his abilities are still shrouded in mystery, aside from racing. Speaking of which, the black bull is... so-so. It's good to control, and it is meant for utter destruction, though it really needs to pull its weight better, as it suffers on slippery terrains and is often really sluggish. Unless if he has an advanced AI, like in the story mode. He does make up for it in his role with the anime, though as he's known to be the leader of his own crime syndicate, Dark Million. And he had some okay candidates such as Zoda, Blood Falcon, Optimian, and even Rick's fallen girlfriend, Miss Killer. Although he probably would have taken a higher ranking if only he didn't screw up with the so-called disguises of Don Genie and Death Form, in which the roles were reversed. 
lame. Hey, no villain's perfect. And I always wish Black Shadow would have a lot more praise from many consumers and countdown artists. Nobody has ever mentioned him on their list. He does give players an appetite for destruction if they should use him well. He even tried to eradicate the whole galaxy by building an invention to serve all the reactor mics. And even use the Dark Ones to manipulate and brainwash unsuspecting victims. I even took him into account in my F-Zero stories if you're interested. He was rumored to cause the horrific accident, allowing him to raise blood fell, and later on resurrect and train this killer who were incredible adversaries. Bottom line, Black Shadow has everything to make a notable villain. He's evil, he has an urge to wreak havoc, he's capable of ruling an entire universe with no relent, and he can be capable of recruiting good henchmen and go to extreme measures on manipulating them. Ever since his debut in F-Zero X, he's been a fan favorite. And I also wish for him to be a competitor for the Smash Bros. scene. And possible. Ah yes, the Kremlings have qualified for second place. Ever since I was a kid, I loved the Kremlin crew. Now some might argue that King K. Rool is either better or he should count. But if I were to choose the boxer mad scientist Pirate King, he would just overshadow them, as they were put under poor and cruel conditions. The Kremlings made their mark in Donkey Kong Country, although it's possible they've been a bunch of crooks in the original series. They were born within the Lost World and gradually made a society for themselves, albeit full of piracy. After some members have fallen from the cutthroats, King King Roll bolstered their population, even started to evolve on Crocodile Isle, and wanting to dominate Kong Island by stealing their bananas and even kidnapping parts of their clan. As a kid, I was a huge animal lover, and most of the inspiration has come from the DKC trilogy. They're mostly known as villains, especially under K. Rool's tyranny, like Crunch and Diddy Kong Racing overthrowing Whizpig in Timbers Island, or sometimes overshadowed by others like Bruntilda, the sharp claws of General Scales, and other colorful characters. They're the most distinctive bunch in not just Donkey Kong, but in all of gaming. Kaboing, Critter, Clump, Cloak, Blacktrap, Crash, Cutlass, Crook, Clank, Clobber, Coin, Kaboom! And those subpar ones like Crunch, Cackle, Crusha, Clinger, Clubba, or even K.K. Rool. I love them regardless! They even inspired me to make my own two Kremlin OCs. Crush, who is Crunch's sister, and Lil Cudgel as their baby brother, who assists the squadron control and ally with the Thundercats. They even learn how to make excellent soldiers. I go crazy for the Kremlings, and Nintendo better bring them back, damn it! Alright, we've counted down the top 11 villains, but before we get to number 1, let's bring out some honorable mentions.
That's right. My favorite villain in video games is none other than the first powerful Pokemon created by genetics. You too. Ever since I first saw him in the debut movie, he has been a worldwide phenomenon and very relatable. We all know he was created by Dr. Fuji and his daughter fell in love with him, until her untimely death anyway. So, never wanting to relive the tragic events, he literally erased all memories from that muscular cat and introduced it onto the world with fragments of living freely like to duplicate you. However, recognizing they were only greedy, heartless scientists, only enslaving him as a test subject, he just went berserk and blew the hell out of the New Island Laboratory and murdering the people in it, along with destroying Giovanni's lab. This was like the first murder scene in the series, and to tell you the truth, I don't blame them. I mean, anyone has been and will be manipulated by low-life humans, even me. I'd experienced enough of that. Since his debut, Mewtwo has been a formidable opponent and final boss of four Pokemon games. And that was only in Gen 1! Much like Ridley, Ganondorf, Bowser, and Wolf, he had his chance to be a smasher ever since his chance in Melee. I'd say he's the most significant and one of the most powerful Pokemon and villains on this earth. And I consider him over those broken powerhouses any day. Trump by Arceus, the Primal Legendaries, Eternatus, the Ultimate Beasts, etc. But my heart still stands with you two. Oh, and lest we forget he's mainly voiced by the legendary Dan Green, HELL YES! He was an epic villain even when you happen to find him in the games, which is like 1991, and he's a lean, mean, psychic machine. Even his debut cloning such super beasts, claiming to be the most unstoppable obstacle, and having his revenge on people and Pokemon who were loyal to his betrayers. But much like several other villains, he wasn't always a bad apple. The reason why he's in first was because he's the most relatable villain even to me personally. I too had lost a loved one a long time ago. I too have felt some humans had been nothing but sociopaths and rotten heartless scoundrels both digitally and for reals. Even when they were treating me with my mental illnesses. I too know how it feels to be taken advantage of by your abilities and how people misuse them. I know about not fitting in on how different we are. It's no wonder Mewtwo's been so iconic and loved by many. I don't care how overrated he gets. And he did have a change of heart after Ash sacrificed himself through his petrification. Wished it wasn't non-canon, though. And he has been a mentor to my Pokemon OCs and the Hero of Time ever since. You two has always been the most impactful, tragic, and relatable villain. Not just to me, but to many consumers as well. I'm the Ekron Rider. And I strongly defend that Mewtwo is the best villain in not just in games, even though it's usually the same, but in all media. Even surpassing the overrated evildoers like Kefka, Hades, the Joker, Dr. Nefarious, Alistair Asmuth, the Reapers, and especially Sephiroth. I only care for my favorites, and he is undoubtedly the very best where no villain ever was.